today's webinar. As Sabrina shared, we'll be talking about uh, the upgrade path from Dynamics Nav to Dynamics 365 Business Central and talking about uh, is it worth it? Is it worth it for you and your organization to go through that transition? Uh, by way of introduction, for those of you who have not uh, previously worked with us at Stoner Software, I thought it'd be nice if we could share a little bit about ourselves to kick to kick off today's webinar. So Stonerge Software is a uh, Microsoft Gold partner. We are uh, continually named one of the best places to work in the, in the Twin Cities area here uh, in Minnesota. Um, we are a Microsoft Inner Circle partner, which is uh, an award or recognition that's provided to the top 1% of Microsoft partners in the channel. Um, and in addition to that, uh, we are, um, <clears throat> we've got over 140 team members. We're actually, I think, now up over 180 team members. Um, we've been experiencing rapid growth. So as I mentioned, we've got offices here in the Twin Cities area. We have offices up in the Fargo, Moorhead area. And then uh, our worldwide headquarters are in Barnesville, Minnesota, about 20-ish minutes south of Fargo. Um, and as a Microsoft partner, we solely focus on that Microsoft dynamic suite of, of products that you see in the lower left-hand corner of the slide. Uh, so AX, GP or Great Plains, uh, NAV, CRM or CE, the customer engagement product, and then uh, the full suite of Dynamics 365 products. When we think about uh, Stonerge Software as a Microsoft Gold partner, we think about how we come to the market a little bit differently than other partners in the channel. So in addition to those accolades I shared and the, the sole focus we have on Microsoft products, you know, as an organization, we hire uh, technically excellent individuals. We are, uh, you know, an organization that really values that technical expertise as well as specific industry expertise. Um, so many of the folks at Stonerge actually came from Microsoft, uh, including our, our ownership. And we do focus on specific vertical solutions like agriculture, manufacturing, construction, uh, to ensure that we've got you know, individuals in our team that are, that are well partnered or well positioned to partner with our clients. We then think about the, the problems that we're solving, right? So typically our clients engage with us for that technical expertise, but also because they've got a problem that needs solving, right? That technical expertise goes a long way, especially when solving a problem. Uh, and for us, um, you know, we think about how we partner with our clients to solve those problems. It's really, uh, you know, taking the bull by the horns, um, looking at that challenging problem or that challenging project and breaking it down into uh, consumable and actionable tasks that we, we communicate with our clients in a way that creates transparency so that we're all on the same page. As we complete those projects for our clients uh, and, and in the partner ecosystem that we work in and the, the different vertical uh, industry ecosystems that we work in, <clears throat> we work to ensure that we have an enlightened community. So that means providing educational materials uh, such as webinars like this um, and our, our various blog posts out into the market. We ensure that our clients understand uh, what technology they own, what's available to them, and how that technology can further be, be leveraged to continue to get a return on their investment. Um, and then for us, you know, getting those connections back to the Microsoft community. So both for our immediate client base and the partners that we work with, but also then reaching out an additional circle, making sure that we've got uh, feedback and communication channels open to Microsoft, <clears throat> as well as others in that Microsoft community. And then as Sabrina mentioned, uh, my name is Natalie Lemke. I am the vice president of our SMB services. I manage our resources across the Business Central, NAV, and GP practices. And I manage resources that are responsible for implementations, upgrades, and ultimately uh, ongoing support. So let's get into the meat and potatoes of our agenda for today. So uh, for us, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, what's going on with the Dynamics or the 365 products. Um, I think it's important for us to talk about what's going on in, in the Microsoft space today around those 365 products. And then we are going to talk about 
why why would you consider an upgrade and from my perspective, you know, I'm on the delivery side of the house. I don't work in sales. Uh, so I think about it more from a, a technical perspective. And, um, you know, as a, a former end user of Dynamic Snav myself, as a former end user, right, what's the impact to your business and, and what are some of those considerations? I will demo uh, Business Central. I'm excited to share uh, the application with you and do just a really brief high-level demo of Business Central for those of you who haven't seen it before. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about those cost considerations. So certainly as you evaluate a transition, uh, it's important to understand the, the cost to your organization. And then before we close out today, uh, we'll talk about how to prepare your team. So making sure that your team really is set up uh, to be successful, whether this upgrade is a short-term initiative for your organization or a longer-term in initiative for your organization. So let's start by talking about uh, where Microsoft is at. <clears throat> so when uh, when we when we work with Microsoft, and if you've read any of the content that Microsoft puts out into the market, Microsoft talks about the transition from NAV to Business Central as really the last upgrade. So uh, you might also hear the phrase evergreen ERP. What that means is, is that as we transition to Business Central, we are transitioning to an application that has updates pushed from Microsoft in the major releases, spring and fall, and then in monthly minor releases that really ensures that that code base remains up to date and you're avoiding those costly upgrades in the future. So as a specific example, our clients today in the month of October and into early November are going through the, through the transition to receive the fall major release where there's a variety of new features and functionality available. Those releases are pushed first to a sandbox or a test environment for our clients. And then our clients are able to schedule the date in which they'd like that imp to, to impact or roll through to their production environment. Really, what that means is, is that in the past, in order to take advantage of those additional features or functionality, you had to go through an upgrade. You had to go through a technical upgrade. We had to go through and migrate or transition that data through technical tool sets provided by, by Microsoft. Typically, there were pretty significant changes to the user interface, so there's retraining for staff. In this model, there's changes that are happening uh, more fluidly. Again, always released first to a sandbox or a test environment, but then you're able to leverage those in the production environment without going through a major event uh, in your organization. So all Business Central users are on the same version. By being on the same version then, you're able to leverage the training content that's available and produced by Microsoft. And as you engage with other Business Central users in the community, you understand that you're all talking about the same application. You're all speaking the same language. Uh, the features and functions that you have available in your base application are the same as the features and functions that that other user has, albeit maybe working in a different business or organization in their, in their install of Business Central. You're staying in lockstep up with Microsoft, right? Um, I, I can't uh, express strongly enough how important that is and what a benefit that is to your organization. So if you've ever gone through and uh, had to apply cumulative updates uh, and jump through those hoops and then perform a technical upgrade, you'll know and appreciate uh, the, the value in, in remaining in lockstep up with Microsoft. And then lastly, the predictable schedule with flexibility. So again, you're able to schedule those upgrades outside of business hours. Those upgrades are, are um, and those code releases are done in a scheduled uh, manner. You have visibility to those in a test environment prior to pushing those to a production environment. Uh, but ultimately, that content is coming straight from Microsoft to you. Let's talk about the architecture that makes this possible, right? So, if we think about the architecture that makes this possible, we're converting from the old world of Cal code customizations where we were adding uh, custom objects, we were customizing pages, we're doing so by modifying the base code of the application. That now is transitioning to extension-based uh, customizations. Those extension-based customizations are written in AL, 
uh, which is a slightly different language than Cal. And really what those extensions are doing is they are clicking into events or triggers in the application that then allows the customization or that AL code unit to sit outside the core code of Business Central. So we're not disrupting or modifying the core code of the application, we're creating extensions that sit outside the core code. That means that when Microsoft pushes those updates to the application, your extension continues to exist sitting outside the code and and firing off the trigger event that still exists in the in the base code, but they're able to expand or extend the feature and functionality set without disruption, right? Uh, so they're not overwriting a customization, they're supplementing something that already exists. This then enables those frequent updates, as I mentioned, and there's a citizen developer platform, so these no code or low code custom apps. That really applies to Canvas apps, um, if you've heard of Power Apps, that's the ability to leverage those uh, those items to then um, either push information into, pull information out of, or action uh, flow workflows inside Business Central again without impacting the core code of the application. So in in historic Nav uh, speak, we would have created customizations in the application to create process flow or process automation in Business Central. There's a variety of different ways we can accomplish that, both using extensions and using things like Power Apps. So now that we understand uh, sort of what's going on, what's, what's the latest in the world of Dynamics 365 Business Central, and the changes to the architecture, let's talk a little bit about why you and your organization might be considering an upgrade. Uh, my colleague, Cody Marshall, put together this slide, and I love it so much, I, I use it every time I do this presentation. It's the proverbial carrot or the stick, and in this case, his stick looks a bit like a baseball bat. Um, so we're gonna start by talking a little bit about the stick, or in this case, uh, that rather scary looking baseball bat. So support, the lifecycle support of um, NAV is expiring. Uh, so we've got mainstream support expiring for the versions that are listed on your screen, uh, including, um, you know, coming up just in a few, I don't know, eight weeks from now, uh, the NAV 2015 mainstream support is expiring. There is extended support through January for the NAV 2009 and NAV 2009 R2 clients. Um, and then we've got extended support coverage. You see quite a ways out for NAV 2013 and NAV 2015. For those of you that don't um, maybe know the difference between mainstream support and extended support, I'm just gonna define what those two different things mean here real quick to make sure we're all on the same page. So if we think about mainstream support, Mainstream support is where Microsoft releases new features, uh, typically in cumulative updates. You're able to install those cumulative updates. Uh, Non-security issues are still being resolved. Security updates and fixes are released, and you can get a hold of Microsoft support. So in an extremely escalated situation where your partner is unable to assist you, or uh, there's, there's a need to leverage Microsoft support, we can, on your behalf or in partnership with you, submit that escalation to Microsoft and a solution engineer will assist you. When, micro, when Microsoft's mainstream support ends for the product, so in this case, if we think about NAV 5.0 versions older or NAV 2009, um, when we click over to extended support, there's really no new feature development being done for the application. If there is a security bug that's identified, they will release a cumulative update that you can, you can apply or patch the application with. There's access to support, um, but typically there's an annual fee for that and a per incident charge. Typically when folks are in extended support, we're at that point where when we have these types of issues come up, we're having critical conversations around, you know, what's the band-aid that we need in the application, what's our path to upgrade. And then, um, you know, when extended support ends, we we land ourselves in the, the land of no support, uh, which as I think we all 
can understand and appreciate. Uh, even if a security bug is identified, uh, no cumulative update is being released by Microsoft. Really, we're on our own, right? So that means that as a partner, we're really uh, kind of the end of the line for support for our clients that are that are at that stage um, where they're on a version that's old enough that no longer is uh, eligible for mainstream or extended support. So that's the stick. Let's talk a little bit about the carrot now. So if you're familiar with the Microsoft Cloud, um, really, you know, this is a, a slide that Microsoft uses in many of their presentations. You'll notice that the Microsoft Dynamics 365 product is in the center of this graphic. And it's not just in the center of this graphic for purposes of this presentation. It's actually at the heart of, of the product suite when Microsoft presents on the solutions that they provide to businesses. So if you think about this and the, the loops that exist here, right? Really, we think about um, you know the Dynamics 365 product. It integrates with uh, the Microsoft 365 suite of products. So we think about Outlook or um, Excel. It is uh, inherently hosted in Azure. So the cloud-based version of Dynamics 365 Business Central is on the Azure Premium Cloud. And really, the, the focus of the features and functionality that are available from the Dynamics 365 suite of products is to uh, help businesses such as yours engage with their clients and, and transform the products that they, that they produce. Uh, and that could be in terms of um, how we bring those products to market, uh, the inventory management of those products, um, the accessibility of those products, different things like that. And then you'll see on the outer loops, there's the optimization of operations, which certainly has a part in ERP, but also, you know, from a workforce optimization uh, relates to that Microsoft 365 suite of products. And then the empowerment of employees, which is a topic that I'm particularly passionate about. Um, but for purposes of this presentation, we're going to dial into just that middle circle. So we're going to talk a little bit more about Business Central. So Business Central is the product that now uh, has replaced Dynamics NAV or NAV. And if we think about Business Central, the core modules or the core functionality of that application is, uh, is the mirror image of what was previously built in NAV, albeit we are now several releases into Business Central and the features and functionality have started to outpace what was previously available in NAV. So the last release of NAV was the 2018 release. We've now had uh, multiple releases, uh, fall of 2018 and spring and fall of 2019, where new feature sets have been added to Business Central that were not previously available in NAV. <clears throat> so the modules that are available in Business Central are project management or the jobs module, if you're currently familiar with that, operations management, the reporting and analytics capabilities are similar to the reports that are available in NAV. So if you're leveraging NAV stock reports, those still exist, as well as native integrations to things like Power BI um, and, you know, the ability to integrate with other with other tools, um, the ability to leverage web services, for example. There's supply chain management functionality, uh, sales and service management. So there is still that uh, sales and service as well as um, relationship management. That module still exists within Business Central. And then, of course, those core financials, which every business leverages. From here, then, if we think about uh, this transition to software as a service. So for folks today who are not familiar with software as a service, uh, you know, looking at that first that very first column, software as a service is really this idea that we're subscribing to Business Central. Business Central is hosted by Microsoft in the Azure cloud. And, you know, really we're subscribing just to those, those couple things. We're subscribing to the application, but we're responsible just for those couple things in the upper left-hand corner of this graphic. So from us as a, as a customer perspective, we're still responsible for how we manage our data, who we give access to that data, um, 
and and the business process rules that drive the data through the application. Any endpoints, um, whether that's users, uh, other integrated applications, exposure of web services, those are all things that we're still in control of, again, in that customer seat. Account and access management, so we're dictating who has access and what they have access to. Uh, and then that identity and directory infrastructure is where things start to transition. From there then, all those things that previously were the responsibility of the customer, if you look at the on-prem column in the farthest right-hand side of this graphic, now those actually become the Microsoft, uh, Microsoft responsibility. So the network controls, the application layer, um, the hosting, you know, those physical components, again, thinking about the server in the closet, right? Those things um, are, are no longer the customer's responsibility, and those things are now managed and maintenanced by Microsoft and a, and a large team of individuals there that are solely responsible for focusing on each of those items listed, and in fact, even some of the, the more granular components behind the scenes that relate to those responsibilities. From here then, let's think about another opportunity, right? So we've talked about the feature set of Business Central. We've talked about uh, the architecture of the application. You know, let's get a little bit more specific though. So as Microsoft is rolling out a different additional feature sets in Business Central, those become available to you upon the, the time that you dictate that that rollout is gonna um, impact your production environment. Some of the things that I, I find particularly interesting to talk about on this slide are things like customer insights. So Business Central inherently has um, some machine, machine learning that's applied to the data in different areas of the application to deliver to you customer insights. And customer insights are things like here are my customers that have a propensity for late payment, or here are my customers that are displaying indicators that would demonstrate that they are at risk of paying late. Um, so really the predictive analytics that give you information prior to, uh, to that late payment actually occurring from your customer. Another area that I find particularly interesting is item variance. So item variance became available in the later versions of NAV prior to the transition to Business Central. That functionality set is available in Business Central and allows us to categorize our items in a, in a different way, separate from the, the product group code or the item category code allows us additional detail or granularity, additional tags that we can apply to our items uh, to add more meaning um, and really to build out the robustness of our item catalog inside Business Central. So lots of things on here that are, are likely familiar to you if you're, if you're in NAV, especially a later version of NAV, but again, this uh, feature set is constantly being built out and really helps us reduce uh, the volume of third-party uh, applications that are needed, eliminate the need for external spreadsheets. Um, you know, leveraging Excel is something that many of us do in our in our day-to-day -day business processes. Uh, this feature set allows us to really take a, take a critical look at where we're doing things outside the system and use new feature sets to pull those into the application. And ultimately, you know, what this drives is a higher return on investment. The more of these modules you're able to leverage, the more you're able to consolidate information into a single source of truth, uh, the more you're able to automate leveraging this feature set, the different business processes that you're responsible for, the more value you're getting out of the application, those, the higher the return on the investment you've made. In addition to that feature set, I think it's important to understand the business applications platform that exists today and to understand how Dynamics 365 fits into that suite of products. So you see Dynamics 365 is sitting on the left and then there's a variety of applications that are listed on the top half of this slide. Those applications all then relate to and sit on top of Azure, and the common data service, right? Uh, and using a variety of um, 
of different mechanisms, we can exchange information across these different applications. The integrations are native to the applications. So the integration between Dynamics 365 and Office 365 is a native uh, integration that requires basic configuration. Similarly, as I already mentioned, we're able to connect Power BI to the Dynamics product. We're also able to connect Power BI for dashboarding and, and reporting to a variety of other applications to combine data sets, uh, either linking to the common data service or data sets outside of uh, the set of solutions and the, the data sources listed on this slide. I talked a little bit about Power Apps and that citizen developer platform, so the ability to automate uh, information into or out of the Dynamics product. You also can can leverage Power Apps in so many different meaningful ways uh, outside of the land of ERP or, or CRM. Um, so really just wanted to talk about the power of Dynamics as a broader part of this suite of business applications, the inherent connect connectedness that comes with the Dynamics product, and really the ability that we have to leverage that machine learning, and, you know, and ultimately longer term, the AI and cognitive services that come, uh, come with Azure. So one question I get asked when I share all of those different fantastic things about Dynamics 365 is how rigorous are the security standards or how do I know my data is safe? Sometimes I don't hear a question, instead I hear this statement, statement I want my data in my facility. And I've got to say, you know, of all the things that Microsoft manages, Microsoft has fleets of people that are solely focused on the standard, the, the gold star standard of cloud security. Um, so if you're currently leveraging Office 365, the Active Directory management is exactly the same. Um, I will tell you the Microsoft maintained infrastructure has a higher, uh, more rigorous set of standards than the typical IT team could expect to do, right? So you think not just about the sheer size of uh, the team that's managing this at Microsoft, but really the, the R&D dollars and the future focus investment that they're able to make in continuing to ensure that they've got the most rigorous standards set for how they're, they're keeping your data uh, safe is really far outpaces what a typical IT team could do. Um, so, you know, again, as I mentioned, the Active Directory is the same as Office 365. Microsoft is maintaining the infrastructure behind the scenes. Um, the, they are with regular and consistent uh, processes doing uh, threat management, so both intrusion detection and penetration testing, uh, so both you know, the watch guard, right? Is anyone trying to come in? And then um, the simulation, what if? What are all the areas where someone could try to break in? Um, those, there is encryption in the data that's exchanged between you and Microsoft, right? So when you think about um, the security layer that exists there, when you're sending data to uh, to the cloud, that data is uh, encrypted and any data then that is pushed back to your machine is also encrypted. Um, lastly, but certainly not least, you know, there's also the, <laughs> there's the role-based security, which we currently have in Dynamics Nav, that similar concept exists in Business Central, uh, but also physical security, right? So there is, um, there is real in-depth security that includes perimeter fencing, video cameras, security personnel, secure entrances, um, data standard, uh, data center security standards that are best in class, right? Um, I don't know if any of you on the webinar today heard the recent uh, 
Azure sale to the Pentagon, but you know, think about the level of security that Microsoft is responsible for maintaining in order to win uh, contracts such as that contract. So um, I'm happy to take questions at the end or uh, Sabrina, if any roll through on the cloud security, but really um, I can't emphasize strongly enough, you know, when I look at this, I think there's no way that an on-prem install could be more securely managed than what Microsoft is currently doing with the Azure Cloud today. So let's get into the fun stuff. So uh, before I jump into the demo, I wanna, I wanna hit on this point. So for anyone who's used uh, Nav on-prem and has deployed the web client, you might have experienced that difference that exists between what you see on your screen when you're sitting at your computer, whether that's your desktop or your laptop, and the rendering that exists on the web client. Uh, Business Central was specifically designed such that whether you're on a laptop, a tablet, or a phone, the rendering slightly changes, but it's native to the application, right? So it's intended to be a browser-based application that allows you to access your data with your secure credentials at any time, anywhere from your personal device, your uh, professional device. Um, and really, when we think about the workforce today, we have a workforce that is increasingly mobile and is increasingly distributed. And we need flexibility in the products that we provide to our workforce to ensure that we aren't creating artificial barriers to getting work done. So I just love the tagline, run your business anywhere, right? Um, as a CFO, you can log in and process approvals for payables from your mobile device. Um, as an operations manager, you can log in from your tablet uh, to investigate you know, what the production schedule is and identify any gaps. It just provides a different level of transparency and a different level of flexibility to your organization. So I am going to flip over um, to Business Central. And like all demos, we are going to cross our fingers. Here we go. So I've got Business Central up here. So I am just going to take a couple minutes to walk through um, walk through the application. For those of you who have not seen Business Central previously, uh, I find this to be um, <clears throat> pretty pretty impactful. Uh, it's similar to Nav, but there are some key differences. So as we look at the application along the top of the page, you'll notice that there are very first thing we see are the menus, right? So our menu suites now exist as uh, click down panes on the top of our screen. For those of you who like the full menu suite, uh, the version 15 release of Business Central now, it now has this business manager which lists all the application areas. So this is more similar to the previous navigation pane that we used to see on the left hand side of our screen. All of these link to the different areas of the application. If we jump back over to our home screen though, I'm just gonna go top to bottom through the home screen to highlight a couple pieces uh, that I think are, are particularly um, user friendly and would be important to know as you're thinking about the transition from NAV to Business Central. So as I mentioned, across the top, we've got these different insight, uh, different um, menu suites that we can click into. You'll notice as I hover over any of these items, uh, they're actually giving me additional pieces of information. So if I hover over, uh, you know, in my activities section, sales this month, it's indicating to me that this is specifying the sum of sales in the current month excluding tax. So it's just providing that additional information readily available to me without any additional action steps or going to a help menu or Googling or looking at my training guide to say, what does this number mean? Um, so you'll see we've got the headlines scrolling across the top. 
the headline is scrolling a set of um, different intelligent insights that are um, that are fed from the data in the application that are specific to my role. So currently I'm set up in Business Central with the role of business manager. Uh, so not only do I care about things like uh, the best selling items, and I'm clicking just to make this advance a little bit faster because I'm uh, low patience, but um, you know, this is indicating to me my insights from the last month and it's sharing with me information about my top customer my largest posted sales invoice, and I can click into this data and Business Central will pull up for me that the transaction set, and then here I can see the 21,580, and I can click into that and see the detailed customer ledger. I also could go to the document from here, so I could click on the document. And again, it's meant to just be uh, self-service, right? So as a business manager, that insight was presented to me what the largest invoice was for last month. I might ask the question, hmm, I wonder who made that purchase. I'm able to click down and see, ooh, a Datum Corp made that purchase and they bought uh, 10 desks, three yellow swivel chairs, and seven whiteboard bases. I'm also then able to really easily navigate back to my role center or my home screen, where in addition to those insights, I've got actions pushed to the top of the page that, again, align with my role. So I, as the business manager, might be responsible for creating sales quotes or creating purchase quotes. Uh, I'm able to link to Excel reports here. This really is just pushing up to the top of the page. What are those things that I most often might be responsible for doing so that I can swiftly navigate to that area of the application? If I scroll down, um, I highlighted a little bit around this activity section. I can specify uh, what data points I'd like to see here. But if we go down, you know, these cues look similar to the cues that existed in NAV 2009 R2 through NAV 2018 on our role center. So it, for those of you that are leveraging the role tailored client with NAV, uh, this will look relatively familiar for you. This is that idea that work goes through a specific process flow and we should be able to measure how many work or documents are in each stage of that process. Again, so that if I were responsible for managing that, as my business manager had on, I can see, hmm, we've got seven sales invoices that are not yet posted or only partially posted. Well, that's revenue that I'd like to, to get uh, invoiced so that I can start collecting payments. Maybe I need to follow up with accounts receivable to find out what's going on with those invoices that have not yet posted. Or maybe seven is a particularly low number for my organization and that doesn't give me cause for pause. On the flip side, I can look over here at my purchase invoices. So again, you know, we've got quote to order to invoice on sales. Similar, we've got order to invoice to payment on our purchasing uh, tiles. I can see here that I've got 13 payments that are due to vendors next week. Um, but I don't currently have any pending my approval. Uh, but again, as the business manager, I could come into here and I could see if I don't have notifications set up, which I certainly could set up, I could go in here and see how many approvals are pending uh, my approval. And then um, I can look at payments, right? So how many unprocessed payments are there? What's our days sales outstanding? So it's the average number of days it takes a customer to pay an invoice. In this case, it's 5.8. I'd say that's pretty phenomenal as a, a day sales outstanding statistic. Um, if I'm not a cash and carry uh, organization. And then outstanding vendor invoices. So vendors that have not yet been paid. And again, this 13 likely links to these purchase orders that are due for payment or purchase invoices rather, excuse me, that are due for payment next week. So again, this is really designed to think about the different work streams that exist in your business, how many tasks are in each bucket so that you can most easily identify uh, what might require actioning. You'll see here we've got the green indicator set up. You can set that indicator up on any of the tiles to indicate uh, 
by different tolerance thresholds, uh, red, yellow, or green, uh, so that as you have new users come into your organization that may not know, you know, 5.8 uh, days as your DSO is actually a phenomenal statistic. Uh, maybe for your organization, um, that's not a phenomenal statistic. We want to set that as red. So it's easy uh, both visually to see what might rapidly need your attention, but also as new team members come in, what's the metrics or what's the barometer for uh, a statistic being um, good or positive for your organization and what might be uh, trending in a, in a negative direction. And I'd like to go down to the business insights. So if I look at the business insights section, uh, you'll notice that my petty cash is at $96,549. So uh, concluding this, we'll be taking petty cash and we'll all be going to Hawaii for the remainder of the week. Uh, no, but it's nice here to be able to set up again. I'm the business manager, so not every role will have access to this, but likely your business manager and accounting manager, uh, maybe even uh, somebody on the the receivables or payable side would have a specific set of GL accounts saved here as their favorite accounts so they can quickly see the snapshot of what the balance is in each of those GL accounts. Any anomalies then immediately jump out, you know, since it's easy for me to say, well, petty cash is awfully high, we've got an issue with accounts payable, right? Um, and our receivables looks as I would expect. On the left hand side, you'll see this business assistance. Uh, this is this can be set to a variety of different graphics. In this case, the graphic represents uh, sales for my top five customers and the distribution of dollars across those five customers. So, you know, I find this pretty impactful. Uh, again, we can set this graphic to be different metrics. Just think about those key performance indicators for your business. What's important to you, again, as that business manager, you wake up, you come into the office, you log in, what are those top three to five pieces of information that you need? Uh, and then configuring this, this role center to align with that. We've got a quick trial balance. It looks like my business is not doing well. Um, and then we can connect this with Power BI. So when we connect this to Power BI reports, we can, um, you know, it's got this uh, sample graphic, the growth this year. I particularly like in the business manager role to set that to cash flow. Um, or net income. I think those are really powerful metrics to set in this area uh, as a graphic. So you can see the trending um, and you can see based on transactions posted month to date where that where that metric is currently at. Uh, but just knowing that in any role within your organization, there's likely key performance indicators that are used to measure performance. And, and we can use Power BI to display that information. Uh, there is a report inbox here, so if team members create and push reports to you, those can be published here. You can then dynamically open those within Business Central and be able to drill down into the background information. Um, all the reports that are generated in, in Dynamics 365 are also able to be pushed or published to Excel. That was just a quick high level overview. Um, you know, again, I just went through the role center. I think there are probably two dozen additional features that I could go through in Business Central, uh, and we'd be more than happy to schedule one on one time to review the application with you and answer any questions that you might have. So if we jump back into the different things that we're responsible for considering as we think about this type of transition, right? So we talked about the carrot, we talked about the stick, uh, now let's talk about cost. And I'm gonna click through uh, to get all of these up. So depending on the version of NAV that you're on, there are different, uh, different considerations that you might think about, right? Um, so what's the scope of the current business processes that you leverage today? What's the degree of change to the system for those processes? So what are the new features and functionality that might be coming available that would impact those business processes? Uh, what are new process items or scope uh, specific improvements that you would um, include as part of an upgrade initiative? Uh, those things, those those three things, the scope of your business processes, the degree of change in the system, and new process scope. To me, those three things are things that um, 
we can identify and parcel out, here's the degree of change that we're looking to impact. All change has a cost. It has a cost to the users in your organization in terms of training costs, uh, time investments, um, documentation impacts, uh, you know, potentially from a process change perspective or new processes being rolled out, right? That all has a cost of, of not just hard dollars, but also time and energy from, from your team members. Um, then if we look at these next couple, so existing customizations, the condition of your existing code and data, um, and the data migration requirements, from that perspective, those three things are areas where, you know, depending on the, the technical debt that you've accumulated in NAV, that's really something that, you know, we've got different options to mitigate costs to say, you know what, these existing customizations really aren't things that we would want to see re-architected in Business Central. We want to peel back the layers to get back to stock functionality. Um, or we know that we want to replace a, a homegrown customization with a third-party ISV um, or a third-party companion product that we would implement in lieu of our previous in-house customization. In terms of existing code, you know, depending on which components we'd like to see upgraded, uh, that certainly impacts the cost of the project. Data is the other uh, the other factor here. So if the condition of our existing data is poor, uh, we would we would have some conversations around what we can do as we migrate that data uh, to mitigate the impact of any gaps in our data or challenges with our data as we move into Business Central so that we can be successful moving forward. From a licensing perspective, one thing I'll note is that uh, there are transition discounts available. Uh, Microsoft has done a variety of different promotional pricing for Business Central. Um, and overall, typically we see a a lower cost long term to Business Central in comparison to uh, a NAV on prem install. And I really like this specific graphic when I think about the cost of ownership, right? So today, <clears throat> your licensing costs are likely smaller than the all up licensing costs that you'll see in the cloud, specifically as part of the transition from concurrent users to individual named users but we're significantly reducing that, um, you know, previously underground cost structure, right? We're transitioning the infrastructure to Microsoft. Uh, we're transitioning um, many of the maintenance components to Microsoft. Uh, so really, you know, we're transitioning those costs to consulting IT resources and training, uh, you know, and we're taking away completely that upgrade component. So, you know, really this isn't a, I typically see IT team members are able to focus on more proactive initiatives as a result of this sort of transition, as opposed to being reactive, uh, managing um, issues with historical or legacy systems, and, and really those big time commitments um, and, and big investments from an upgrade perspective. So if all of this sounds good to you and you're thinking to yourself, uh, what can I do to prepare? What are the things that I can do uh, to get ready for this, this transition, Natalie? And again, this might be a short-term initiative for your organization, it might be longer term. Something that I think is incredibly important and, and for many organizations out there, we have this conversation every day, start cataloging your different business processes and if documentation exists, uh, make sure it's up to snuff. If documentation doesn't exist, evaluate the most critical business processes that you have, that might be around operations, that might be around finance, and identify a short list of documentation that must be created, again, around those high risk or high impact business processes um, that you've got today, you likely have got a set of system changes that you would see as part of an upgrade already identified, either opportunities for improvement or necessary changes. Make sure that that uh, identification list of those system changes is, um, is consolidated and that you've got an identified owner in your organization for that list. From a code perspective, <clears throat> 
you know, really truing up, okay, where do we have gaps in the code that we've we've got in NAV today? Um, review those third-party ISVs. So are there any ISVs that really um, are supplementing the, the NAV business process that aren't adding the right value or are no longer the right fit for our organization? Um, if you've got an internal developer, look at the customizations page modifications, uh, are there any custom reports that were developed that aren't being leveraged anymore? Can those be deprecated? Um, report modifications, documenting uh, what those are accomplishing. And then from a data perspective, think about what you're willing to purge your archive versus what you absolutely must pull forward. Any area where we've got data that we can purge because it's no longer value add, or we can transition to an access database, or uh, a, if we've got it logged in a data warehouse, can we purge it from ERP? You know, from my perspective, that's one of the biggest opportunities that we have. Um, you know, we look at dormant records, you know, vendors that we haven't done business with in 12 years, or customers that um, we created the record and there was never a financial transaction. You know, purging those from our system can make a big difference as we prepare to go through an upgrade. And then in terms of team preparation, uh, we have, we've got a couple different things that we can do. So think about um, if you've got internal developers, uh, have them start getting familiar with the new architecture of Business Central. So there's a whole host of different training content out there on the conversions from CAL to AL. Uh, if your team currently isn't leveraging Visual Studio or DevOps, uh, think about um, training opportunities for your team when it comes to DevOps uh, for the 2020 calendar year. For anyone who's in a technical or infrastructure role, helping them understand uh, how the application is managed or maintenanced in the, in the SaaS world, um, how extensions work, and the power of app source, the, the area in which we can purchase and deploy uh, third-party applications from app source directly to uh, the Microsoft application. And then for any business analysts or business process subject matter experts, getting them introduced to uh, the project, letting them know that this is a strategic initiative for your organization and where you expect there to be uh, new processes or um, in partnership with Stone Ridge or, or uh, you know, the Microsoft content that exists, helping them understand what new, new features are coming available so that they can start to wrap their mind around the change management uh, and the communication plan for those changes. And then what's next? So if, if again, you're identifying this as a strategic initiative for 2020 for your organization, uh, talk to us, contact your account manager or your project manager. Uh, we are doing a consistent series of webinars on this topic, uh, so we'd love to have you back for those future webinars. Um, or watch our blog. Our blog is a constant stream of information from the technical resources on, on my team, uh, things that are relevant to organizations that are thinking about making this transition.